So what's the correct name for tin tetrachloride? We said that it was tin 4 chloride. And the idea is you look at chloride, chlorine, you find that it has a negative 1 charge. So chloride is negative 1. And it takes a positive charge of plus 4 to balance for negative 1 charges. So because this is an overall zero charge compound, you know that these four negative one charges have to be balanced by a plus four charge. Okay. Uh, again, this is the book's nomenclature. You can use it if you want. Um, type three compounds are quote unquote molecular compounds. The idea is that these things aren't ions that are just sort of loosely bound together. They actually have a bond, they're sharing electrons. Um, they are not charged ions. So we can look at these. It's kind of a weird way to introduce it through nomenclature, but uh, CO2 is a molecule. Like the smallest unit of CO2 isn't a C by itself and two O's floating around. It's C bound to two O's. And it's uh, if you divide it up, it changes the um, reactivity, the very nature of that uh, substance. So that's different than ionic compounds or ionic formulas that we've been looking at, where these things are bound together not by sharing electrons and staying close together, but by just charge. So sodium and chloride have opposite charges, they're attracted to each other, but if you put them in water, they sort of just float around independently of each other. Whereas if I have CO2 in water, it's not going to, the C isn't just going to like fall off the O's, it's going to stay with the O's, it's bound to the O's through a chemical bond. Okay, so we have type 3, this is when two non-metals are uh, bonded to each other, and there's a lot of ambiguity here. It's a lot worse than when we had non-metal metal, because like bonds can have different. There, there really isn't a charge involved anymore. I can't do the accounting I was using before. I used to say, okay, the the bonds have to, or the, the charges have to balance, but it's not like that here. So we have to add even more information into the names. Um, the only really big trick here is that mono is dropped if it's fr in front of a, the first element. So instead of calling this mono boron trihydride, we just call it boron trihydride. But I have to add the word tri because otherwise I really don't know what's going on. I don't know that there's three H's to one boron unless I add the tri. Carbon monoxide. We just saw CO2. Now I'm talking about CO. If I just said carbon oxide, you'd have no idea. So you have to specify carbon monoxide for one C and one O, or carbon dioxide for one C and two O's. The same is true of other non-metal, non-metal binary compounds. So pent means five, you can use this chart. Um, you don't have two vowels in a row. I mean, there's just weird kind of naming conventions. It sounds weird too, penta oxide versus pentoxide. Sounds weird to me. I've seen this so many times. It sounds weird. Um, okay, I can try to name these compounds, and I'll probably get most of them right. So, 1C and 1O. It's carbon monoxide. Not monocarbon monoxide, but just carbon monoxide, because I don't have to put the mono in front of the C. For CO2, that's carbon dioxide, the greenhouse gas everyone's worried about, including me. Um, so, again, no mono in front of the C, so carbon dioxide. Nitrogen triiodide. Uh, dinitrogen monoxide. I think I got that one right. Um, diboron trioxide. Dichlorine. Ooh, hepta. I'm uh, sorry. Heptoxide? Dichloride hectoxide? Yeah. Yes, heptoxide. <laughs> Next. Um, silicon tetrabromide. Water is called water. Actually, sometimes it's called aqua if it's in part of a bigger complex. And NH3 is called ammonia. So what's the proper name for IF5? Let's see. 
Anybody? Okay, B. That looks good to me. <laughs> so the thing is, it's interesting about this. It's iodine because the I is first. So it's not going to be the anion in this case. So it's not going to be the ide. So we're going to call it iodine or iodine pentafluoride. The F gets the ide because it's the second one in the name. It's the anion. It's the one that's to the right. Put on. Given a chemical's name, we need to be able to write down a formula. So it works both ways, right? I can give you a formula and say, give me the name. And I, can, I should be able to, if it's a good enough name, tell you, give me the formula. OK? And you have the periodic table to help you. So radium oxide. I mean, I don't even know about radium. <laughs> I know it gives you cancer, but that's all I really know. So I can look at the periodic table, and maybe that'll help me out. That'll, that'll do. So so um, yeah, here's the periodic table. Radium is in the second column, so you're going to say plus 2, right? And oxide is in the uh, 2 from the noble gas column, so it's going to need two electrons to complete its electron set to be the electronic configuration of neon, like noble gas. So it's going to need two more electrons. So it's 2 minus. So radium is plus 2, oxygen is 2 minus is oxide. So case closed, right? If someone says radium oxide, it's just RAO. Done. Now, the thing is, if I wasn't sure about this radium, if I was skeptical about it, I could use the oxide all by itself. Or if, if I said, hey, you know, there's some new elements and it, it forms, you know, EO as a molecule, I should be able to say that E has 2 plus. So you, you can try to use the periodic table and it should help you. Dinitrogen pentoxide. So is that N2O5? Does that sound good? Okay. Iodine monobromide. Is that IBR? Okay. I'm not seeing any dissension, so I'm going to go with it. Nitrogen monoxide, NO. Sometimes a group of atoms has an overall charge. These are, yeah. So for groups of atoms that are bound together by sharing electrons, they're not really divisible. And if they're, if they're grouping has a charge, it's multiple atoms, so it's polyatomic, and it has a charge, so it's an ion. And you see these a lot. Um, sulfate. Sulfuric acid contains sulfate. Um, so we'll start seeing these in problems. The ammonium ion is a cationic polyatomic ion. It has a plus charge. Carbonate bicarbonate. You don't need to memorize these. I'm just you know, showing off. These are in the notes. And I was like, why not? They're pretty common. For now, if they're on, on an exam, I will give them to you. I might require some memorization by the next midterm. But for this midterm, you're fine. You need to know how to balance things, though. Yeah, so this is just more showing off. It's kind of like a Big Mac, kind of. Right? Yep. More of them like that. Okay, so this basically follows type 1 and type 2 non-ambiguity and ambiguity. So if it's something like sodium sulfate, sulfate has a minus 2 charge. So it takes two sodiums to balance that. So it should be sodium 2 sulfate. Um, if it's something like iron sulfate, I need more information because iron could be iron 2, it could, iron could be iron 3. So I need to know what's going on with that. They need to give me more information. OK. Do, do, do. Hydrogen peroxide is H2O2, one hydrogen per oxygen, that's how I remember it, and there's two of them. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of any of these are very interesting. 
I don't think so. <laughs> oh, here's a good one. So iron sulfate. I just talked about that, right? So iron two sulfate. Is that right? No, it's actually iron three sulfate. So each sulfate has a two minus charge. There are three of them, so that's a minus six charge for all those sulfates. The irons, there's two irons, they have to counter those six minus charge. So each iron has to be plus three, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, so when I, when I think about the sulfate ion, I think about it as like one thing. Like I don't even have to worry about what's in there anymore because I, I'll give you on the exam and in general you probably come to memorize it by accident. Like SO4, that, that is the sulfate ion. Like you'll be given it and basically you should think about this as like 2 minus, that's <laughs> like some, some big like, you know, ion ball or something. That, that's how you have to think about it. So like if someone says Fe2 three of them? Yeah. If someone says there's three blanks, they each have two minus, then you should be like, okay, well that means a six minus total charge for those three. And six minus, how do I get iron two of them to make a neutral overall compound with the six minus in it. Well, that means the irons have to have six plus, and there's two of them, so each one has to be plus three. There's probably a really easy equation to memorize, but I'm not really into memorizing stuff, so I just talk it out and use logic. But you, you could, you know, write out stuff on the bottom. I don't think it's going to get that complicated or that messy. You could be like, okay, each of these is a plus two. So that's like plus six. And there's like two of these. I don't know, there's X's. I don't know what they are yet. So two X, it ha they have to balance the plus six. So two X has to equal negative six. Um, so I divide by two on both sides and I get negative three. This is like silver acetate. I mean, I, I recognize some of these, but you know, I'm not jumping in. What is the correct name for this? CO3 2 minus is the carbonate ion. So I would call this magnesium carbonate. And there's no ambiguity here because carbonate is always 2 minus, magnesium is always 2 plus. It's in that second column on the periodic table. So this is like a type 1 unambiguous metal nonmetal compound. And that's C. That's the answer you're looking for. You don't have to say magnesium too. In fact, if that was an answer choice, you should not pick it because that's extra information. It's like redundant. It's a bad name. It's over specified. So magnesium carbonate, magnesium two carbonate, not right. What is the correct name for copper with these two nitrate groups? Nitrite, okay, nitrate, sorry, is NO3 minus. There are two of them, so two nitrates have a two minus charge total. So what does the charge of copper have to be? Two. Yeah, plus two. Plus two to balance out the negative two charge. So copper is one of those special ones, right? Copper can be either plus one or plus two, and you'll have a list, so you'll know. And you, and you could also look in the periodic table and see it's one of those tricky transition metals. It's in that ugly region in the middle, right? Like this is the periodic, why am I doing that? <laughs> Unnecessary. Yeah, copper is right here. That's copper. So you just look at the periodic table like, whoa, that's in like a danger zone. I don't, I don't want to deal with that. And then you look at another list that shows you the ambiguous elements out there that have weird optional charges that you don't really know what it is until somebody tells you. So you know you have to have Roman numerals there. 